Uh, today, that's where we're going to be. We are uh, almost done with the book of Revelation. It, it's exciting because we're getting into really fun times, but it's sad because it's been a fun adventure. But before we get into Revelation 21, I have a quick story for you. Uh, 10 years ago this July, my wife Erin and I, we got married, okay? And uh, we decided we wanted to have a honeymoon, but instead of going in hot July from like 95 degree Omaha to 100 degree Cancun, we decided we would wait until December for our honeymoon. Uh, and so that's a pro tip for those of you thinking of getting married in the summer, you get all your thank yous out of the way, all of that, but that's not what this is about. Uh, we went to a resort. It was our first time for either of us to go to a resort. Uh, we both came from pretty simple families, big families, didn't take a lot of vacations. And so we went to an all-inclusive resort and it was awesome. Like we, we arrived at this place with more pools than I've ever seen in my entire life. You, we had a, a room overlooking pools and uh, the Gulf of Mexico. I remember the first night we went to our meal and even though like Cognitively, I knew we already paid for everything. We went to our first meal and like they served us. It was like the most amazing food. And uh, at the end of it, we we're kind of like, when do we get up? Like, what do we do? So we like looked over at the couple that had been there a little longer than us. Like, we just like get up? And they're like, yeah, you've, you've already paid for it. And so it was awkward. It, it was just special to have like a refrigerator full of bottled Coke. And every time I left the room and I took one, another one would just reappear magically. This place was awesome. We could sit on the beach, read our books, uh, drink as many Shirley Temples as we wanted without ever having to move. It was a glorious, glorious place. If I could picture heaven like growing up and, and I had an image of what heaven would look like, it would be a place like that where I had to do nothing at all. And I could just experience God's creation. And I thought for a while we were in heaven until we started walking down uh, the beach to kind of check out the other resorts. And then we came across the beach where apparently clothing was optional. And at that point I realized <laughs> this is not heaven. It is not heaven at all. Uh, today, I don't know what, what your thoughts are on heaven. I don't know what your imagery on heaven has been growing up. I know we all have a lot of it. For some of us, uh, our first thoughts are directional. We think of heaven as like a place where God is way up there in the clouds, maybe pearly gates and, and all of this cool stuff. And then we think maybe we've got family members up there and they are just watching us, watching our every move, cheering us on and, and, and rallying us every single day. And then one day we're gonna get there and they're gonna throw a welcoming party for us. Or for some of you, it might be a surprise party. I don't know. Uh, but we Im imagine heaven uh, kind of in those ways. Or maybe you imagine heaven as the place where Fido went and you can't wait until he licks your face, the pearly gates, you're gonna arrive there and St. Pete is going to be there to tell you a really terrible joke because every terrible heaven joke has St. Peter. But I, I don't know what your thoughts on heaven are, but today as we dive into uh, imagery in heaven, found in Revelation 21, we're gonna find out maybe some truths, maybe some of the things you think about it are gonna be confirmed. Maybe some are going to be debunked, but my hope is as we dive into the book of Revelation, as we, we look at this imagery in the new heavens and new earth, that you leave in awe, <laughs> that, that we all come to God's word and we are like so grasped by the marvelous sight and thought of what heaven will actually be like, that we leave here more hopeful for our present lives because of our hope in the future. But before we go in, let's just jump in and pray uh, for the scripture. God, thanks for your goodness. Thanks for your word. Thanks that you've given it to us. It's such a grace that we have the ability to, to come to this, to hear from you. And that's our, that's our hope today, God. That's my hope that people hear from you. That people are stirred by your spirit through your words, through imagery in heaven. No matter what we've walked into this place, with or no matter what we are sitting on our couch thinking about, no matter what is in our present reality, God, I pray that we would find hope that's eternal. And so we pray this and ask this in your holy, humble name. Amen. So today we are going to be in Revelation 21. So if you've got your Bible, you just like open the back few pages. It is literally the second to last chapter inside of your Bibles. And we're gonna be talking about a new heaven 
and new earth. And a lot has happened so far, so let me catch you up really quickly so you know, at this point, uh, the rapture has come, the tribulation has already occurred. No matter where you stand on that theologically, it's already happened. Jesus' millennial reign has happened. Uh, The lake of fire and Satan has been thrown into all of that. All of that stuff inside of Revelation has happened at this point. And so now we get into this place where we get to experience after all of that, after the judgment of the dead and the lake of fire that Pastor Mark talked about last week, we get to heaven. So verse one is going to start like this with John seeing this image. He said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. A couple of things I want to just stop off and point at about uh, chapter, I mean, verse one here is that word new. So the word new, it can mean a lot of things. Even if you looked it up in dictionary.com or if you have a Webster sitting around your house, you'll find a lot of definitions of new. We use that word pretty interchangeably for a lot of things. But in Greek, uh, they had different words that would represent different kinds of new. So there were words that meant like literally brand new. It's all like it never existed. And then all of a sudden it existed. And then there's words that talk about like being renewed. Think like renewing a 55 Chevy. It was all rusted out, but it's come to be renewed and has new life again. It's kind of like we talk about as Christians when uh, the old has passed away, we were baptized and were raised to new life. Uh, That wasn't the first time we start breathing, but God has given us a new life, a new renewed, redeemed, restored life. And so that word that is used there is kainos, new. So there's a new heaven and a new earth, but it's not just, God's not just like blowing up and imploding the old planet because we read in Genesis three that that God created this place and he said it was good. And then we came in and we messed it all up and we'll read a little bit more about Eden restored next week with Pastor uh, Mark. And then the other thing we see here that's, that's an important note is that there's no longer any sea. And so first pass, you might read that and you think there's no water, maybe oceans are gone. It's just all a big mass of land. And, and that's not what's happening here. For, for the Jewish audience and, and inside of even Revelation, the sea is a stock image for chaos. It's a stock image for evil. And so, in fact, in Revelation 15, we see that beast coming out of the sea. Evil is coming out of chaos and the sea. And so it's saying that there's going to be this new place, no more evil, no more chaos. And this is really good news as we already are into verse one. And now as we move into verse two, it said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. This imagery here of of the holy city and the new Jerusalem, it's kingdom imagery. And inside of the New Testament, we see kingdom imagery all the time. In fact, Jesus is talking about bringing a kingdom. And for a kingdom to be brought, it's, it's a people and a place and even a ruler of that place. And so this is talking about the church, the, the people of God are part of that city. The place is, is, is dropping down this new city in Jerusalem. And, and it's this wedding imagery, which we find all throughout scripture. We even find it in like one of the famous uh, wedding verses that we read at, at a lot of uh, weddings in Ephesians where it talks about like a husband and a wife and mutual submission. And then all of a sudden it like ends with this random. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this mystery between Christ and the church. And we see some of that mystery revealed here. I think one of the moments inside of life that God gave us a grace to try to understand what's happening here, this consummation, this holy matrimony of heaven and earth, God and his people, his presence and his people are our weddings. And that's the imagery used here. I remember that day in July, 2010, where uh, I was in the chapel, wherever the chapel is here, uh, and I was getting married to my wife and I'll never forget that moment. The doors burst open, everybody stands, the music plays, and, and, and I'm a groom that's just watching step by step as my wife is coming. I'm, I'm trying to hold in like all of the emotion and all of the tears, and, and there's just something transcendent about that moment. Every step she takes closer, it's like this anticipation rises more and more. It's one of the reasons I love doing weddings because we all feel that transcendent thing. I love just standing there as the minister and just watching everyone's faces. Watching the face of the groom. 
maybe a, a tear rolling down his eye, just elated. Every step feels like it's eternal. I love looking at the face of the bride who, who sees her groom and she's walking toward him with so much joy and glee. The dad who's about to, to give his daughter away. The mom, the grandma, everybody there. It's like this, ga- this gift of God, this transcendent grace of God to see when heaven touches earth. And it's the the beautiful imagery that we get inside of here, this consummation, this holy matrimony of God and his people that he's been working so long for. I think something transcendent, something that we don't fully understand happens, and that's why we get so emotional in that beautiful moment. We keep continuing on to verse 3. And John said, and I heard a loud voice from the throne of God saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. I, I picture that voice being a giddy voice. Uh, You know, and not like a Ryan voice where it's like really deep and booming like God, you know, but like a Jed voice where it's always giddy and always smiling and he's ready for this consummation to finally happen. That's the voice I hear from God inside of this moment because he is going to restore all that is broken. Everything that went wrong in uh, Genesis 3 at the fall of man and, and, and he's been preparing his bride throughout this entire book and we see glimpses of it over and over and over and finally it's about to happen all the way here in Revelation and he is so giddy for this moment to happen because something really bad happened way back in Genesis. On the other side of our Bible, three chapters in, we find out that God created this this beautiful, this awesome place called Eden, and he said it was so good. And then the fall happened. People messed up. Adam and Eve, they, they, they were deceived into to thinking that God wasn't good and, and they listened to, to the serpent trying to, to tempt them. And at that moment, every relationship was broken. The first relationship was broken was internal relationships. They were broken at the fall. That relationship between me and me, we see it happen with Eve when when God's like, hey, you're going to have kids and there's going to be pain, not just physical pain, but there's going to be emotional pain and, and all of this stuff starts to happen inside of her life. And we feel it in our lives too, don't we? I remember, uh, you know, growing up and, and before I was a dad, I'm like, I would never, ever get angry. I would never, ever yell at my kids. And then there's moments in my life where I let that take over me and I let my kids, I yell at my kids, I send them in their room and I'm just like, who was that? That's not me. Like those moments where I feel like I'm a stranger trapped in, inside of my own body because my internal relationship was broken. We spend so much of our lives trying to medicate that internal relationship, trying to medicate those cravings, those those things that lead towards depression, those things that lead towards a negative body image, and we want to restore and fix that. We feel this pain in the forms of addictions, in the forms of uh, mental health. We feel this in the emotional struggles, the body images. For all of us, in some way, there are moments where we just feel, and it's true because our chemistry is off. We weren't made to live like this, and we feel almost like a stranger in our own bodies. Not only were internal relationships broken, but external relationships were also broken at the fall. We see that at this point, this is where Adam and Eve, they're going to have conflict. They're going to have different desires and passions. We, we see this in the ripples all around us. Whether you're married or you have kids or you work with people or you have a family or you're an American citizen and you vote, we see this happen everywhere. Our external relationships are broken. And marriages and family in workplaces around the water cooler. And not just between people and people, but people on the planet. That relationship was broken too. We see that God's telling Adam, it's gonna be hard for you to get food now. 
You're going to have to work and you're going to have to sweat and you're going to have to work really hard because this relationship between people and the planet is going to be messed up. There's going to be pollution and and earthquakes and, and fires and floods and all of those things because of the wake of sin. God's going to redeem and restore that. And the last relationship we see is broken at the fall is an eternal relationship. Perhaps it's the worst. Our relationship between us and God. See, man was present with God. They were in God's presence at, at all times. But in that moment, a perfect and holy, just God, it was broken by sin by the rebellion that sin caused in their lives. And so God sends them out of the garden and and then all of a sudden there's always gonna be this struggle, this battle for the throne of our hearts between us and God and an eternal chasm was built in that moment like we talked about earlier. And, And God is finally going to make all of this right. All of these ripples of sin are going to be made right in Revelation 21 says, I will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This, uh, a couple days ago, my daughter, who is 18 months, she was running through our house and, and she had her like footy pajamas on, they're super slick. And she, she hits the carpet and she wipes out. She's got cochlear implants. And so they both flew off and she just starts bawling. She's unconsolable. She can't hear anything I'm saying. And, and then something, something happened when I picked her up. I took my thumb as a dad and I wiped those tears. All of us in our lives, we have tears from pain and brokenness and we've screamed out, God, where are you? And it says he's going to wipe every tear from every eye. This vast, glorious God who breathes galaxies It's going to be intimately with his thumb wiping every tear from every eye. There's going to be no more death or mourning or crying. The old order of things is going to pass away. See, what God is doing here in this moment is God is bringing his presence to his people for his purpose. God is bringing his holy presence finally to his people to fulfill the purpose that he created all of them for. It's this beautiful culmination in this moment, in this new heaven and this new earth. Verse five continues, it says, he who was seated on the throne. After John gets this vision, now he's gonna hear the one seated on the throne. Say, I am making everything new, kainos. Then he said, right this down for these words are trustworthy and true. So God is affirming what John had just seen in this vision. He's like, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it new. Write it down. Write these words down. It's trustworthy and true. And he knew that he needed to write these words down just like the rest of Revelation because there was a struggling church. If you remember, if you turn all the way back to the beginning of this book of Revelation, this letter uh, that that Jesus was writing to these struggling churches, it was to give them a great hope because they were about to face some pretty hopeless things. Everything that we read, everything made new, everything right and restored in here, that was the opposite of what this church was about to face. That was not going to be the reality for these people. We continue on and we, we read verse six. It says, he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from a spring of water, the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious, you will inherit all of this and I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. He's saying that people are going to be rewarded in this moment, either really good reward of this new heaven and this new earth, this new Jerusalem, or they're going to be rewarded because of their willingness to not bow down to to God, their, their, their uh, temptation to give into themselves, to try to live life under the illusion that they actually have control and they're going to 
uh, be sent to this lake of fire. For more on that, again, Pastor Mark talked on that last week. You can go find it on our website or YouTube. But uh, the, the, the reason that I think this was so powerful, and it's really good news for us, but I think it's better news if we understand the news that was coming to, to the people, the original uh, readers, this struggling church, because they were about to enter the darkest age in church history. He's saying, blessed are you guys who, who, who uh, stay with this, who, who continue to be victorious, those who, who don't move, who are believing, because you're gonna inherit all this. What, what the church was about to face in the next few years and decades was terrible, terrible stuff. The people that were reading this for the first time some of them would be burned at the stake. Some of them executed like Christ on a cross and most would say, can I just do it upside down because I'm not worthy to, to be killed the same way as my savior. For sport, some of these people would be thrown into a coliseum, them versus a lion. because of their belief in Christ. And, and, and people for sport would just watch them be ripped apart. For a government to be able to, to prove that they had victory over these people. But early, one of the early church fathers, he, he talked about the stuff that these people went through. And he said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Friends, th this letter, this living hope that, that was being written to these people to continue to tarry, to keep going, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how bad your present situation is, to have eternal hope, it worked. You know how I know it worked? You're here right now. You're watching right now. The church is still alive and it's still active because these people, the blood of the martyrs, the people who have paid, who have endured, They've paved a way for us and, and we have an ability as a church to flourish because of what they paid, because they had an eternal perspective inside of their lives. This wasn't just for them, some imagery, a nice little pamphlet of a retirement place one day. This was their living hope. This is what, what kept them going. This is what kept them from denying Christ in the middle of those terrible, terrible, terrible situations. From the pain and the struggle, the church has grown more than they could have ever imagined. People in Omaha, Nebraska are able to bow their knee to Jesus because of the blood of the martyrs. Uh, we don't have time to fully get into everything that's in verse nine uh, through 21, but if you open your booklets, you'll find on page 44 and 45, a few things that talk about that. You'll also see an image uh, of, of a cube, this place that our, our great artist Dylan, as he, as he went through these verses, he came up with uh, some imagery for maybe our finite brains to be able to wrap around what this, this could look like. And, and so we see that this thing that's a cube and for these people that are reading these dimensions of 12,000 stadia, they, they would have understood this cube language. It would have brought them some other thoughts in their minds of another cube that they were used to, a 15 by 15 foot cube, uh, which was part of a temple and a tabernacle. It was a place called the Holies of Holies where God's presence would dwell. <laughs> And so they would, have, they would have been thinking of this is a place where God, his presence is going to, to dwell. And as they, they think of the scope of 12,000 stadia, that's a roughly about 1,400 miles cubed. And for them, they're, they're thinking this is the whole known world. For them, that, that picture of, of that large of a scale, they didn't have uh, maps or globes spinning in their, in their houses or at school. They were picturing this vast thing, this, this place where the, the holies of holies, the, the presence of God is going to dwell forever and ever. So we see that imagery there and we continue on in verse 22. It says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, there it's temple. The city does not need sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light. And the lamb is its 
lamp. This is imagery that that Jesus was hinting at in John 1, where it says he was the light. And in John 8, where he he tells us he is the light. This is finally going to be the light of the world. Jesus, God, the lamb, his presence is going to light this place up with his glory. No need for other created thing because the glory of God is going to be so overwhelming in this place. Moment. We also see on page 44 a few other pieces of imagery. We see the 12 foundations of precious jewels, it says there. One of those represented for each disciple. We see 12 gates of pearl, where we get the pearly gate ideas, and three per side, and angels are at each gate, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And we continue in 20, verse 24, it says, the nations will walk by its light this light, this glory of God, and the kings of this earth will bring their splendor to it. We see something like nations here. We see a diversity and we see the splendor of a diverse God who who created nations. And in each of them, they have their own creativity and their own economy and their own commerce and their, their own things that they do. And all of these things, all of these kings of earth are gonna bring all of their best splendor to this place. And on no day will the gates ever be shut. Why won't the gates be shut? Because there's going to be no night there. There's going to be no fear there. There's going to be no reason for invasion. Sin has finally been cast away. No intrusion, no invasion, no way someone's going to come and try to take this place over. The gates don't need to be shut. The glory and the honor of all nations, they're going to be brought to this place. We see diversity there. And then 27, it says, nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. These people... (laughs) These people who had bowed their knee to Jesus, these people who had believed in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, that, that he had given them a new life. Those people, that was how they got their names written in this book of life, and they are going to be there. And only people who have surrendered their lives to Jesus will have their names written inside of this book, and they will be the people that inhabit this place with the glory of God forever. And ever. This is a reality of a covenant, a covenant that God gave way back at the beginning, and He's been writing and writing and writing throughout all of this book. It's this covenant, the reality of that holy matrimony between God and His people. God is bringing His presence to His people for His purpose and in this very place. And church, this was a, an invitation for the early church to hope then, despite their circumstances. And it's, a, it's a, a, an invitation for us to hope now, despite our circumstances. Throughout history, we've seen that the people that care the most, the people that do the most in this world are those who don't just think about this world. C.S. Lewis puts it brilliantly in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, if you read history, you will find that the Christians that did the most for this present world were, those, were just those who thought the most of the next, eternity. It is since Christians have largely ceased thinking of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this. That Christians get so uh, swamped in what's happening here, so swamped in, in uh, partisanship and politics and, and what's happening in these moments when our lives are just a, a vapor, a, a piece of mist in, in eternity, past, present, and future. But we get so caught up putting all of our time, treasure, and our talents into what's going on in our circumstances that we forget of eternity and it changes the way that we live. See, the hope that we have for the future, it dictates how we live right now in the present. Think of the the two, two people that were captured as prisoners of war. One of them living with the hope that that he would be rescued and one day he would see his family and he'd get to hug his wife and he'd get to be with his kids again. And the other decided to not have hope, to just give up. He, He was stuck in here. No one would ever come and rescue him. Two prisoners in the same place with different perspectives. The guy with no hope, he, he ends up totally dying. 
Because without hope, his body starts to shut down. He's got nothing to live for anymore. But the one who held that hope, he's reunited with his family. Friends, sometimes the worst prison we live in is that of our perspective. Sometimes the perspective that we are living in is actually keeping us in our own prisons. The perspective that is far too small, the perspective that thinks it's all about right here and right now, about that next raise, about what I can put in my retirement, about what is in hap- what's happening in my life. And when our perspective gets too small, we cease to think of eternity and we get put in a prison that thinks it's all about this. It's all about me. It's all about this country. It's all about what's happening right here and right now. Sometimes our perspective puts us in shackles, doesn't it? But let me remind you that because of the work of Jesus Christ, you do not have to live as a victim. You live victorious because Jesus Christ came to live a perfect life, die and raise again. We have a victorious life. We don't have to walk around as victims. We are victorious people. And this is the good news of the kingdom. This is the good news that is promised to the people in Revelation 21. We have a glorious hope because we have a glorious God. A God who would stop at nothing to come and redeem and rescue his people that rebelled against him over and over and over. But this God stopped at nothing to redeem and rescue those people. And he's going to come and bring his people and his presence to this place for his purpose. A God who breathes galaxies and takes his thumb and wipes every tear from every single eye. Intimately. We're not prisoners of our past or our present problems, but we are people that are promised a flourishing future. And this is a great reason for hope. There's gonna be no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more sadness, no more of the ripples of sin in this place. And and we can cling to this great, great hope. All of that, all of the ripples of sin in this moment will be wiped The way everything that's broken will be fixed. Our internal relationships between us and us, those body image issues that you have, those anger issues, those compulsive issues, those addiction issues, the, the ways that you feel like your chemistry is off and you're trapped inside of the wrong body, all of that's going to be restored and redeemed in this moment. And you can have a hope for that. Every external relationship, every, every marriage, every family struggle, every political struggle, all of those external relationships are going to be fixed and redeemed and restored. No more of that in this moment. No more fires ripping up acres. There's no more earthquakes. There's no more tsunamis. No more of the groans and the pains that our earth gives us. No more pollution or allergies. All of those things in that moment are gonna be redeemed and restored. And and that, that cosmic gap between us and our God, it is going to close in this moment because God is bringing his presence to his people for his purpose. And that is what the kingdom of heaven will be like. And having a proper perspective of this, it puts things in its place. It affects how we live life right now. It affects how we live and how we, how we buy and how we build and how those things go on into eternity. That's why it's so important for us to be people that live the kingdom of God now. A hope that stretches into eternity cannot be crushed by present realities. Nothing happening in your life. If you have a hope that stretches into eternity, everything that, that this book says, all the promises, if you, if you keep giving into this, living with this hope, then nothing in this present world can crush you. Friends, when we live with this perspective of a hope that stretches into eternity, our lives look different. It's what our mission here at Christ Community Church is all about, making disciples of Jesus for kingdom impact. We believe we have a role right now in this kingdom to make impact. 
Those of us who are filled with this hope, we get to be, as our friend Myron says, hope dealers. Not people that are hope hoarders, but people that deal hope, people that have this hope for this future, people who are walking around on our streets who are wondering what's gonna happen next in America and is everything gonna fall apart? Are we gonna have a civil war? Is everything going to break down? No. And if it does, we have a hope. A hope to give out to people that goes into eternity. And we are not going to let our present realities crush that hope. The kingdom of God is our future hope, but it's our present reality. So when we think about the ways we invest our time, our talent, our, our treasures, we must invest in the things that are eternal. Church, we cannot think for a second that God is up there with a pencil in his mouth, an eraser on his ear, trying to create some blueprint for a new five-star, triple diamond, double platinum resort up in the sky. He's not trying to come up with the next iPhone that's going to wow us, the next vaccine that's going to keep us alive a little longer. No, all of those things, every amenity in this world pales in comparison to the glory and the splendor and the marvel of being in the presence of God forever. That's why these moments of worship feel so good. And friends, we don't have to wait to be in the presence of God. See, because of the work of, of Christ, God came and tabernacled among us through Christ and he sent this thing called the Holy Spirit, his, his presence. And not only do we not have to wait to access the presence of God, the presence of God wants to access us. <laughs> The Holy Spirit that lives and resides inside of us, it's the thing that emboldens us and empowers us to live with this great hope. God is bringing his presence to his people for his purpose. I, I, I can't think of a better way to end this service than to get to worship Jesus, our living hope, than to get to sing those, those uh, words from that song again. But before we get there, I'm just gonna invite you to pray with me. Pray a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and followers to pray, a prayer that is bold and it actually invites God's kingdom to come on this earth right now as it is in heaven. So we'll have the words on the screen. I know there's a lot of ways people have said this and so I'm gonna put the words on the screen so we can say it together, whether you're here live or you are at home, I'd invite you to pray this with me and then we will close in song. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.